Mayang hapon, sinyo tanan-tanan. Kumusta kamo? How are we doing this afternoon? Excited for Psalm chapter 21 and 22? Ah, they're very good psalms. Let's get into the Word by opening up with a word of prayer. Salam liwa gino para sa nihapon, Father. We just thank you for the opportunity as always, Lord, to spend some time in your Word desiring to hear from you. Especially as we come to one of the most powerful prophecies that exist in the Old Testament. Lord, a direct prophecy concerning your crucifixion. Not just what would take place, but even what was happening inside your mind, your heart, Lord, revealing your thoughts as you were on the cross. And Lord, we just pray that ministers to our heart this afternoon as we learn, we look at the power of exactly what you did when you redeemed us from our sins. So we give you this time. In Jesus' name we say, Amen. Amen. Well, you recall, sa nagligat, as we went through Psalm chapter 19 and Psalm 20, ang paborito sa akong, by the way, was Psalm 19. I genuinely love that psalm because it answers the question, is there a God? Sabat sa inyo, is there a God? Oo ko hindi. Oo, sagrado, good. But how do we know there is a God? What is the evidence of there being a God? Number one, the general revelation of creation. Everything we see, the stars, the moon, the planet, all of the creation, people, mga tao, everything around us declares the fact that we are not an accident. We are created. Pero, it does not tell us who that God is. It is a general revelation. For the specific revelation, we need to go to the Word of God. And the Word of God tells us who God is, why He created us, and what He requires of us. So through His creation, generally, and through His Word, specifically, we know everything we need to know about God. That is Psalm chapter 19. It is a psalm of revelation. Psalm 20 was a psalm of salvation. And it was actually a psalm of David, pero... It was a psalm sung by the mga tao, sa people of the nation of Israel, sang for the king that he might have victory on the day of battle. And important they did, they were praying the king did not put his trust in horses or in chariots, kusog sa mga tao. Don't put your trust in the strength of men, but instead in the name of the Lord your God. They wanted their king to be godly, because basta may godly nga, you know, authoridad. If we have a godly person in power, a godly person in government, the people will rejoice. And that was the prayer for the king to have salvation through trusting in the Lord. Which brings us to Psalm chapter 21. Psalm chapter 21 is about the heart of the king. And this is an interesting psalm. Notice verse 1, we have our typical introduction. It is to the chief musician, a psalm of David. Now, whenever we see the title, to the chief musician, para sa ato, ni, how many times have we seen this? Sulit, sulit naman. It speaks of the fact that this was a song to be sung to the congregation of Israel to teach them something. It was a psalm of instruction for the congregation, for they learned through their worship. And of course, the writer was King David. Pero, pamate, this is a messianic psalm, meaning this is a psalm concerning the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus. And it's going to be interesting how we're going to see this because it's subtle. It's not as obvious as Psalm chapter 22, but it is very much still a messianic psalm. For notice, we begin in verse 1, reading the fact that the king shall have joy in your strength, O Lord, and your salvation, how greatly he shall rejoice. So this is a psalm about the king having joy in the strength of the Lord. Pero may pamukot para sa inyo. Sino ang hari di? What king are we talking about? Now, presumably, you would assume, and I would understand why, ang sabat sa inyo would be Hari David. Because who wrote the psalm? Sino nagsulat ni? Hari David. So who would the king be that you're talking about? Well, you would think it would be King David. But you would not be correct. A little bit of review. Hopefully, don't know 
that when we talk about the Old Testament, the Old Testament is in different manuscripts. All of our Bibles are translated out of what's called the Masoretic Text. The Masoretic Hebrew text is about Israel Libokatoig. It's about a thousand years old. That is what every modern Bible, it is all translated out of that text. But it is not the only one. There's also something called the Septuagint. Do you guys remember the Septuagint? We talked about this back when we were in the origins of the Bible. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So you have the Masoretic, which is the manuscript the Bible is translated out of. You have the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. You have the Targum. The Targums are the Aramaic translation of the Old Testament. I know in lots of different languages here. Follow along. There's a purpose for this. Your Targums is the language of Babylon. During the time of Isaiah and afterwards, Babylon began to rise to power. Until eventually in 586 BC, they conquered Jerusalem and took them into captivity for 70 years. Then the Jewish people began to learn to speak the Babylonian language, which was Aramaic. And since all the Jews spoke Aramaic, they began to translate the Old Testament into that language, into a manuscript known as the Targums. Now here's the reason for telling you all that. If you read Psalm 21 in the Targum, which is very similar to Hebrew, by the way, same characters, same alphabet, very similar words. But if you read it in the Targum, it tells us the king is the king Masiach. It's the word Melech Masiach. The king who is the Messiah. That is added in the Aramaic and I find that absolutely fascinating because what it means is, is that who is the king this passage is talking about? Are we talking about King David? No. Who are we talking about? Who is the Messiah? Who is the Messiah? Jesus Christ. This is a messianic psalm that talks about the heart of the Messiah. It's the heart of the king, but specifically the heart of the Messiah. Now let's, in light of that, look at verse 1 again. The Messiah, the king, shall have joy in your strength, O Lord, in your salvation, how greatly the Messiah will rejoice. Now get the picture. Who did Jesus depend upon for his strength? Did Jesus depend upon his own strength, according to Psalm chapter 21? Well, no. He depended upon the strength of the Father. Now, Jesus himself would say this in John chapter 5, verse 19. He said, I do nothing of myself. I can only do what I have seen the Father do. He depended on, followed the example of the Father in all things, which is a pattern for us as well. And by the way, it's not that Jesus is not strong. Jesus is infinitely strong. Jesus, with one word, created the heavens and the earth back in Genesis chapter 1. Kuso, kuso, gidsha, pero. To give us a pattern for our example, he depended upon the strength of the Father, so we might recognize we need to depend upon the strength of the Lord. How are we strongest? Where does our strength come from? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. When we are weakest, that's when we depend upon the strength that is God and nothing is then impossible for us. We are strongest when we depend upon, look to the grace of the Lord. In our weakness, His strength is made perfect. Amomanta ka Jesus. That's the same pattern that He was given. Jesus had the strength of the Father, just as we are to depend upon the strength of our Lord. But not just the strength of the king, notice there in verse 2, he also had the heart of the Lord. For we read, you, speaking of the Messiah, have given him his heart's desire. So what desire did Jesus have? Did he have his own desires? Did he follow his own wants, his own likes? 
Well, no. Lewat. He had the desires of the Father. Whatever the Lord wanted, whatever God desired, that's what Jesus desired. He had the desires, the wants of his Father in heaven. Now, Jesus himself would say this again in John chapter 6, verse 38. He said, I have come not to do my will. Lewat. Ang gusto sang gino, ang gusto kay Jesus was not to do His will, but the will of the Father who sent Him. So what heart did Jesus have? We had the heart of the Father. What strength did Jesus have? The strength of the Father. Everything He did came from the Father. Now that's wisdom for us as well. For where should our desires come from? Well, oftentimes... We kind of have our own ideas on what we think should be done. Now, maybe even for the right reasons. My pinsar kita, my buot kita, they're like, I, I think this is what would be best for my life, Lord. We have our will, our desire. But ultimately, if it's our will, our desire, well, then it's our plan and our responsibility. God works not in our desires, God works through His desires. And we only see the work of the Lord performed in our life. We only see the power of the Lord on display when we allow His will to dominate our hearts. Psalm chapter 37 verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will put His desires into your heart. He gives you our desires. And that's the idea is the king had a passion to ultimately do the will of the Lord. When we abide in Jesus Christ, do you know we can ask for anything we want and God will give it to us? It's quite the promise. John chapter 15 verse 8 tells me, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you desire. And it will be given to you that my Father will be glorified in you bearing much fruit. So we can ask God genuinely. We can ask whatever we want to the Lord and He promises to give it to us. If we are abiding in Jesus Christ. For if we are abiding in the Lord, we're going to ask for the things of the Lord. And then you can be guaranteed that God will respond to those because we have His desires in us. And we will bear much fruit through which our Father will be greatly glorified. And that's the heart, that's the idea. This is the heart of the King. He depends upon the strength of the Lord to accomplish the work. He has the heart of the Lord, so He desires what God wants. And therefore the Messiah, Jesus, was effective in everything that He did. But that brings us to a second thing we notice. We see who is the king, but notice in verses 3 through 13, we see the response of the Lord to the king. How does God respond to this king who depends upon the strength and has the heart of the Lord? Apat kabilog. We're going to notice four things in light of the response to the king. Number one, notice verse 3, the Messiah would be successful for you will meet him with a blessing of goodness. You will set a crown of pure gold upon his head. So ultimately, the very first thing that was response of the father to the son, because he depended upon the strength and the will of the father, was blessings and goodness. A crown of gold. He was given victory from the Lord. Now, we all know what it's like to fail. Has anybody here ever wanted to do something and it didn't work? Tried to do something and it failed. We've all had that opportunity of failure. The question is, how can we be successful? Where does success come from in life? Turns out one thing and one thing only. If we are depending upon the strength of the Lord and we have the heart of the Lord, we will find success from the Lord. It's that simple. It's that easy. If we are looking to God, there's no way we're going to fail in anything we do. Psalm chapter 1, you may recall, we went through this. The man who delights in the law of the Lord day and night, he will be blessed in what 
whatever he does. We find success as we look to the strength and the will of the Lord. Therefore, in the same way, the Messiah had great success because he had the heart and the strength of the Father. Number two, there's a second result or response that we see to the Messiah in light of his having the strength in the heart of the Lord, and that's in verses four through six. And it is joy. Notice we read, He asked life from you, and you gave it to him. Length of days forever and ever. How great is your salvation. Honor and majesty you have placed upon him. For you made him most blessed forever. Made him exceedingly glad with your presence. So Jesus, the King, the Messiah, asked for life. Ang sabat sanggino sa iya? You will have not just life, you have eternal life. And he blessed him with great glory and salvation. Now, interestingly, our word salvation, we're familiar with this. Basta makita sa Old Testament ang pulang maluwas. It is actually the word Yeshua. So the Father blessed great glory and honor upon Yeshua. Upon Jesus Christ. Because he was blessed forever, rejoicing with joy in the presence of the Lord because of his strength and will coming from the Father. We read this, by the way, also in the New Testament. Not just that Jesus was blessed here. We're told in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, that one day God will give him a name highly exalted above every name so that every Ni should bow. Tanantanam mga tao nagluhod. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Therefore, there is an incredible reward that comes with seeking and serving God. Everybody bows to Jesus Christ. Now, interestingly, Philippians chapter 2 tells us every knee should bow. Ang alam mga tao, kung nakantindi kita, ang isa ka portahan, isa ka dalan sa langit, nagluhod kita subong. We're going to bow now to Jesus Christ because that's salvation. But you know that Romans chapter 14 verse 11 tells us one day every knee will bow. May dua ka po tunidad. Sigurado maluhod, pero saan no? If we bow now, it is in salvation. If we reject, we will still bow one day in condemnation and judgment. The bottom line is because of Jesus Christ trusting in, having the heart and the strength of the Father, He has victory. Everyone will one day bow to Him because He will be forever in the presence and the joy of the Lord. Number three. The third response to the King, third response to the Messiah there in verses 7 through 12. And that is judgment. For notice verse 7 tells us, The king trusts in the Lord, and through the mercy of the Most High, he shall not be moved. Your hand will find all of your enemies. Your right hand will find those who hate you. You will make them as a fiery oven in the time of your anger. The Lord will swallow them up in his wrath and the fire shall devour them. Their offspring you will destroy from the earth, their descendants from among men. Now, we're told that the Messiah, the King, he puts his trust in the Lord, in the Father. Therefore, he cannot be moved. He is immovable because of his confidence in God. Instead, tanantanan contra sa all of his enemies, all those who are opposed to him, will be found and they will be judged. Anyone opposed to Jesus Christ will be consumed in his fiery anger, literally destroyed from the face of the earth. Now, interestingly, when it says here that they will be destroyed in the fire, going back to our Targum, Maliwat, the Targums, are the Aramaic translation of the Old Testament. When you read this passage in the Targums, it adds they will be destroyed by the fires of Gehenna. Now, I found that very interesting. Have you ever heard the word Gehenna before? Are you familiar with that term? Oh, oh, and it. 
Some oo, some hindi na lang. Mixed na lang. Okay, let me explain what Gehenna is. Gehenna is actually the Hebrew word for the Valley of Hinnom. Ge means valley. Hinnom is the particular place. If you go to Jerusalem, to this very day, Jerusalem is surrounded by three valleys. Medyo mataas ang siyudad. It's up on a hill. To the west of the Temple Mount, you have what's known as the Tyropian Valley. To the east, by the Mount of Olives, you have what's known as the Kidron Valley. So there's two valleys on the sides. Pero to the south, the southern borders of Jerusalem, you have the Hinnom Valley. The Hinnom Valley is Gehenna. That's what that word means. Now, Jesus would use this word in the New Testament. You don't see the word Gehenna in the New Testament. You see the word hell. For every time Gehenna is used, it's translated as imperno, hell. Do you remember the passage where Jesus said, better to cut off your hand than to go into imperno, hole. Better to pluck out your eye and keep yourself from sinning than go into imperno, hole. That word imperno here is the word Gehenna. Here's why it's interesting. It's a word picture. For what happened was, during the reign of King Manasseh, Manasseh was the son of Hezekiah, one of the most wicked kings to rule in the southern kingdom of Judah. Manasseh would take his children, imangabata, ng halatzila. He would burn them in the fires of Molech. The way he would do this, quite a gruesome thing, by the way, they would take a statue, a bronze statue, revolto na lang, it was hollow on the inside and they would put wood inside of it and light it up so that the bronze would become red hot. And the bronze statue would have outstretched arms. They would take their newborn infant, lay them in the arms of Molech and watch as they would be burned to death. Literally cooked alive in the arms of their God. This was offering your children in the fires of Molech. This is what Manasseh did. And he did it in the valley of Hinnom. It was such a reprehensible, such a terrible, such a horrific crime before God. That when the son of Manasseh, Josiah, who was a godly king, came to power, he turned the valley of Hinnom into a dump. Paramangas basura na lang. Was basurahan. And it was that up until the days of Jesus. It was this big pile of trash. Now, if you ever go to the Bukid, basta may basura, wala pa mga lugar para mahaboy sila, what do they do with the trash in the Bukid? They burn it. And that's exactly what the Jews would do. They would throw their trash out into the valley of Hinnom and they would light it on fire. And so every time you looked out of the city towards the southern valley of Hinnom, what did you see? Smoke. Fire. It smelled terrible. There were worms crawling around in the trash heap. Flies were everywhere. It was a horrible picture. And Jesus pointed there and said, that is like hell. He used it as a picture, an illustration of Imperno. That's why he would say, do not go whole into Gehenna, the valley of Hinnom. But that same picture is used here in Psalm 21. For the victory, the judgment that will come from the Messiah is all of his enemies will be thrown into Gehenna, into that place of eternal torment and separation from God. Now the idea is powerful. It's that if you do not come to Jesus Christ, if you do not bow the knee to Jesus Christ, then there's only one other opportunity, one one other destination that we can go to, and that is the lake of fire. Gehenna, that eternal place of judgment separated from God. Therefore, to the Messiah is victory over his enemies, judgment for any who stand against them. Uh, For notice verse 12 goes on. For they intended evil against you, they devised a plot, but they were not able to perform. Therefore, you will make them turn their back. So quite simply, though the world wanted to kill the Messiah, and the world did crucify him, 
they could not hold him in the grave. Ultimately, Jesus was resurrected and he now turns around and brings judgment against them. They wanted to stop him. He will end up judging them because he will win in the end. Which brings us to the fourth and final thing regarding this psalm of the king, the heart of the king. And that's the response that brought praise. Notice verse 13. Verse 13 finishes up with, Be exalted, O Lord, in your own strength. We will sing of your praise and your power. So literally that word, be exalted, means tindaga. Rise up, O Lord. Rise up in your own strength. Perhaps speaking of the resurrection. Nabanha, Lord, get up out of the grave because we are going to sing intensely about your praise because you have power. And ultimately, that's the point of the psalm. Jesus, who had the strength of the Father, Jesus, who worked in the will of the Father, ultimately will receive victory from the Father. He will receive judgment over his enemies, but he will redeem all who put their trust and praise in him. Therefore, like the psalmist, we sing praise. We desire to worship our God because he, Jesus, the Messiah, was victorious. Psalm chapter 21 is the psalm regarding the heart of the king, specifically the heart of the Messiah. Questions before we go into Psalm 22. It's a bit of a warm-up because Psalm 22 is where it gets fun. Let's pick up. Psalm chapter 22. Psalm 22 is the psalm of the cross. We'll talk more about why in a minute, but it is the psalm of the cross. Notice it opens up with a rather typical introduction to the chief musician. Set to the deer of the dawn, a psalm of David. So, Liwat. This is to the chief musician. This was a psalm to be sung to the congregation to teach them about the Messiah. More on that in a minute. It was sung to the deer of the dawn. We're not quite sure what that means. That is probably just the tune that the psalm was sung to, like the particular notes, the progression. So they would have known a psalm or a song called The Deer of the Dawn, and that's what they sang this psalm to. That's the best guess. It's really pretty much all we know about it. We're not quite positive what that refers to. But it is a psalm of David. It is a messianic psalm again. No question, no doubt, this is a psalm about Jesus Christ. Now, interestingly, in Jewish tradition... This is a psalm that is read during the Feast of Purim. Do you know what the Feast of Purim is? Have you ever heard of the Feast of Purim? Some blank stares? No? Quick explanation. You know about Pentecost, Passover. You know about the Feast of Rosh Hashanah, which is the beginning of the new year. Yom Kippur. These are the seven Levitical feasts out of Leviticus chapter 23. But you also have the Feast of Purim. The Feast of Purim is usually held in March on our calendar. It's a different one for the Jews. It remembers the book of Esther. How God saved the Jews from evil, wicked Haman through Queen Esther. They remember this Astasubong to this day with the Feast of Purim. The Jews will read Psalm 22 during the Feast of Purim. But we know it points to something far more powerful. For Psalm 22 is the second most quoted psalm in the entire Old Testament. It's quoted more than almost every other psalm, except for Psalm chapter 110. 110 is quoted more, but Psalm 22 is number two. Almost all of the quotes are in the Gospels and are quoted in regards to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. This is a psalm 1,000 years before the cross detailing what would happen on the cross. Liwat. David is writing, 
It's a thousand years before the cross ever happened. And David is going to give us intimate, intricate, personal details, not only about the crucifixion, but about what Jesus was thinking when he was on the cross in Psalm 22, making this one of the most extraordinary psalms in all of the Bible. Psalm 22, absolutely amazing. It is the psalm of the cross. Now it opens up with a very familiar saying. Notice verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? From the words of my groaning, Oh God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and am not silent. Now that verse 1, let me read that to you in Hebrew. See if it sounds familiar. That verse 1 in Hebrew is, Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani. Have you ever heard that before? It is quoted, it is actually given to us in Hebrew in the New Testament. It is one of the seven final sayings of Jesus Christ on the cross. Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because... One of the most powerful, painful things that ever took place in all of history was the separation between the Father and the Son upon the cross at Calvary. Do not miss this. The Father and the Son are one. How many gods are there? How many gods are there? But one God in how many persons? But you still only have one God. How can you be separated if you're one? Well, you can't be, obviously. You're one, there's no separation. Yet the cross did what had never happened in all of eternity. It caused a separation between the Father and the Son. Because God who is holy could not look upon sin that was unholy and it was at the cross that Jesus took upon him the weight of all sin from all men throughout all time not talking about bugat bugat gid do you remember the name of the garden where Jesus prayed gethsemane do you know what gethsemane means it's a very interesting name it means the olive press where you take olives, crush them with a huge stone until the juices, the oil flows out. What happened to Jesus in Gethsemane? The weight of all of the sin of all mankind came down upon him, crushing him, separating him from the Father. Which is why he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you rejected me? You have ignored my groanings. Day and night I'm crying out to you, but you do not hear. You do not listen. By the way, quoted in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. Also quoted in Mark chapter 15, verse 34. But it had a purpose. Jesus took on our sin so that he might give us his righteousness. Key verse, critical verse, one of those ones underlined in your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 tells us that he who knew no sin, he became sin for us that we might receive the righteousness of God through him. He took our sin, he gave us his righteousness. This was the purpose and the point of the cross. But it caused the separation of the Father and the Son. Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani. But notice he goes on in verse 4. But, God you've forsaken me, but you are holy, enthroned in the praises, are literally the psalms or the songs of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. So God is holy. That word is kadosh, balaan. 
He is apart, separated, greater than anything this earth has to author. And he is literally pleased in, enthroned in the worship and the praises of men. And men, specifically Israel, trusted the Lord. Notice the word trust. Pagdo'o, this is our Old Testament word for faith, is used three times just in verses 4 through 5. The trust that Israel had was in the Lord. You cried out and were delivered because they trusted in you. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. They put their faith in the Lord. As a result, God redeemed and delivered them. If we are crying out for help, but we're not trusting in the Lord, then is it no wonder we're not being delivered? If we're going, Grabe, you know, nga abud la sa akong abuhi sa buong. Lord, why don't you hear me? Why aren't you responding to me? Where are we putting our trust? Where are we putting our faith? Are we trusting in kwarta? Are we trusting in atong kusog? Are we trusting in our abilities? If we are, then there's going to be no outcome, no salvation, no help. But for those who put their trust in the Lord, their faith in Jesus Christ, their faith in God the Father, there will be redemption. There was for Israel. Ultimately, there was for Jesus Christ. A moment sabang, there will be for us today. God forsook for the sake of the cross, but God redeems those who put their trust in Him. They will be delivered. But that brings us to a second thing we notice in verses 6 through 10. And that's that Jesus was despised. For notice verse 6. I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. Now, the idea here is that Jesus, when he was being set up for the cross, when he was being prepared to be crucified, he was hated by everybody. Who stood with Jesus? Who helped him out on the cross? Who stood by him when he went to be crucified? The answer, quite simply, is no one. Peter tried, kind of. I mean, he pulled out the sword in the Garden of Gethsemane. Bless his heart for his effort. Peter was a fisherman, not a soldier, and he proved that. His best effort with the sword was lop off a dalangan of a poor guy named Malchus. That's all he got done. And not very effective in saving Jesus from anything, but he tried. And he did follow after Jesus, but that didn't turn out so good. What did Peter end up doing? Three times, he denied the Lord. So Peter turned around. He was the only one that even followed Jesus. By the way, every other apostle, every other disciple ran away. One of them ran away naked. We're not sure who that was. Some say that was probably Mark, who was the nephew of Peter. But nobody stood around. Everybody just took off running. Jesus was alone. Jesus was despised. Jesus was reproached by all men. He calls himself a worm. Have you ever seen the maggots? Mga langaw, bata pa. Crawling on like dead meat or maybe tay na lang. It's just repulsive. I mean, you don't go up and go, oh, let's play with those little worms. They're so cute looking. You know, let's keep them as pets. We don't do that. They're nasty. And that's the idea here is I am a worm. I am revolting. People see me and they want to look away. It's absolutely horrifying to them. No one wants to even look in my direction. But the word worm is interesting. Perhaps you remember from our study in the book of Job. The word here for worm is the Hebrew word tola. Do you recall the tola? I like the tola. It is powerful and it certainly comes into place right here amazingly. For the tola is a particular kind of small little white worm in Israel. Now, interestingly about this worm is, is that it likes to climb up on trees. And when it gets up to the tree, it attaches itself and then it dies. But as it dies, it bursts open, leaving a deep red stain upon the tree. It is such a powerful stain, you cannot get it out. 
They use the contents of this worm to make a red dye. If you wanted to, back in times of the Bible, to make a crimson pula gid, a red dye, you would use the tola. But as it dies, the red turns to white as it dries and flakes off, giving birth to brand new tola worms. That's how it reproduces. Now, in light of that, you can see a picture. For Jesus attached himself to a tree. He stained it red with his blood. But through the red blood of Jesus Christ, we were made white as snow. Through his death, we were given new life. He is a worm. He is the tola. By the way, the same word is used in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. Isaiah 1 18 tells us, come now, let's reason together. Though our sins are as Scarlet, the word is tola. Though our sins are pula pula gid, they will be as white as snow. Jesus was a worm, the reproach of men, for the sake of our redemption that we might be forgiven. Powerful, powerful right there in verse 6. But notice not just a worm in verses 7 through 8, he was also alone. He says, all those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out their lip. They shake their head saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Now, interestingly, this idea of trusting in the Lord is something that we find in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Do you recall the Pharisees? The Sadducees? The religious leaders? Paglabay sila sa cross? He was hanging up there on the cross. And they began to mock him. He saved others. Let's see if God will save him. Quite literally, exactly what's being given here was what took place when the chief priest walked by. Now, ironically, there was no way that Jesus could save himself without condemning us. Liwat. If Jesus had come off the cross, everybody would go to hell. It was not nails that kept him up there. It was not Roman soldiers or Jewish priests that made sure he did not get down. And it certainly wasn't God that made him go up there. He chose to be there because it was the only way that we could be redeemed. No one killed Christ he laid his life down. Now he would say this himself in John chapter 10, verse 18. No man takes my life. I lay it down, pero I have the power to take it back again. Why? Because without the cross, we were hopeless. We mentioned this in Agligad. I'll mention it again because it's quite graphic and I think it really paints a powerful picture. When we talk about our goodness, we talk about being a good person. According to Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, the most righteous, good, upright, holy person, apart from Jesus Christ, is still filthy rags. Our righteousness is nothing. And never will be. It is never going to be good enough to get to heaven. We deserve judgment. I I like when people say, God, why me? Why did this happen to me? You know, I'm a good person, Lord. Why did you let these bad things take place? Really? We deserve hell. We deserve to be eternally separated from God. Anything short of that is grace. It's not that we are good and don't deserve bad things. We're bad and it's His grace that gives us good things. Everything Jesus did, His suffering, His being rejected, His being mocked was for our sake because we needed His grace. Jesus was alone so that we never would be. But there's a third thing we notice in verses 9 through 10. And that's that he still trusted in the Lord. Though he was a worm, though he was alone, he never lost his faith in God. Notice verse 9. But you are he who took me out of the womb. 
You made me trust while my brothers, while on my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from birth, my, from my mother's womb. You have been my God. And the idea is simply this. Jesus never stopped trusting in the Lord from the moment he was born, when he became Emmanuel. Do you know what that means? It means God with us. When God came down, when God chose to take upon human form, from the moment he was born, from the moment he was raised with Mary and Joseph, all the way through up to his crucifixion on the cross, do you remember the last words of Christ? Father, into your hands do I commit my spirit. From the moment he was born to the moment he died, he put his trust wholly in the Father. Because that was the only place that was worthy to have his confidence. We can put our trust in a lot of things. We do put our trust in a lot of things. But no, there's only one thing worthy of our trust. If we are trusting in this life, if we are trusting in the person next to us, I'm not going to trust you. We don't put our confidence in anything in this life because the only thing worthy of our faith is Jesus. We put our confidence as he did in the Father from our birth to our death. He is the one who we put our trust in. I love how Peter put it. Do you remember, don't know, when Jesus gave the teaching in John chapter 6 that in order to be saved, you must drink his blood and eat his body? Speaking of the crucifixion, speaking of the cross, looking forward to communion and having that fellowship with the death and the suffering of Christ. But it was very hard. People left. Many people walked away from the Lord. He had hundreds of followers before that. He had a few after it. And Jesus would turn to Peter and say, Ikaw man, mahalin ka. Will you leave me as well? Ang sabat ni Pedro in John chapter 6, verse 68 was, Lord, where would I go? You alone have the words of eternal life. You're the only one who can open the door to heaven. You're the only one who can save. God, where else could I go? Who else is worthy of my faith? Listen, Jesus was a worm. Jesus was alone. But he set the example that even in the hardest of times, there's only one place to put our confidence, our trust. But that brings us to a third thing that we notice in verses 11 through 21. This is the crucifixion. For quite detailed, quite in-depth, David is going to describe the crucifixion to us a thousand years ahead of time. Now, the first thing we notice in verses 11 through 13 is that there was a lot of trouble. For we're told, (coughs) Be not far from me, for trouble is near. There's no one to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. The strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and a roaring lion. Now, presumably, what this is speaking of is the trials of Jesus Christ. When we talk about the trouble that is near him, what trouble did Jesus face that no one came to help him during? His trials that ultimately led to his crucifixion. They were the bulls. These very strong, it's a picture of great power. Powerful rulers, powerful leaders, powerful men who were coming ultimately to try to destroy him. They were hungry lions wanting to see him devoured. Is the trial before Ananias. Ananias was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest of Israel. Briefly, because this is some interesting history. If you remember your Old Testament, the high priest was always the son of the previous high priest. Ang Batani Aaron, he became the next high priest. 
Ang apo ni Aaron, the batani, his son, became the high priest after him. It was a heretical line. It followed the genealogy. So a high priest was always born into his position, which makes it very interesting that the high priest during the time of Jesus was the son-in-law of Ananias, not the son. Why? Because in this time, the high priest was no longer according to the word of God. It was a political position that Rome actually dictated. Caiaphas was the high priest because Rome said you should be the high priest. This is how out of line and how wicked the Jewish faith had become in this point in history. But the first trial was before Ananias. The second trial was before Caiaphas. That's in Matthew chapter 26, verse 57. This is, by the way, ultimately where they said he needs to die. They tore their clothing. They said, what further proof do we need? He has called himself the Messiah. He should be put to death. Pero no hay problema para ila. The Jews could not put anyone to death. They had lost that right. In order to execute somebody, they had to involve Rome. So you had two trials before the Jewish leaders. But then you had a trial before Ananias. I mean, before Caiaphas. Not Caiaphas, sorry. Pilate. Your first trial before the Romans was the trial before Pilate. Now, Pilate found Jesus innocent. You find that, by the way, in the book of John, chapter 18, verse 38. They brought Jesus to Pilate to have him executed, but Pilate said, I find no fault in this man. In fact, he tried to release him, but they said, give us Barabbas, not Jesus. So ultimately, Jesus was scourged, but there was a fourth trial. Because in the scourging, they found out that he was from Nazareth. And because he was from Nazareth, Pilate said, oh, send him off to Herod Antipas. Because that's Herod's territory. So Jesus was taken before Herod when he said nothing. He never opened his mouth. They put the robe on him, the crown of thorns on his head. They mocked him and sent him back to Pilate where ultimately he was crucified. But he had to go through one trial after another, convicted by the Jewish leaders. He was given a, a nighttime trial, which is illegal, before Caiaphas. Brought before Pilate, found innocent, but then sent before Herod, still found innocent, still crucified. He was surrounded by strong bulls who wanted to see him destroyed. This presumably is what we're talking about in verses 11 through 30, the trouble that surrounded Jesus Christ. Which brings us to verse 14 through 17, which is his piercing. For he goes on to say, I am poured out like water. All of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my draws. You have brought me to the dust of death, for dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all of my bones. They look and stare at me. So, first of all, let's discuss this piercing, because this piercing is interesting. He talks about his heart melting like wax, his strength dried up, him being brought to the dust of death because they pierced his hands and pierced his feet. When you read this in the Masoretic text, we talked about the Masoretic is the text, the Jewish text, all Bibles are translated out of. The word here for pierced is different. It's the word lion. So literally it says, they basically surrounded me with lions in my hands and feet. Kind of a weird statement, but that's what the actual Masoretic, the Jewish text reads. But if you go back earlier, not the Masoretic, which is a thousand years old, you go back to the LXX or the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation that's 2,000 years old. You find the word pierced. What it seems like is that the Jews, after the formation of Christianity, changed Psalm 22. There in verse 21, so that it did not read pierced because they recognized how much that pointed to Jesus Christ. But the actual statement, the actual text, if you go back far enough to the earliest manuscripts, does read that they pierced my hands and my feet. Now that's interesting. 
Here's why. In Jewish culture, if you are going to be executed, how is it done? How did Jews kill somebody? There's only one way. According to the law, haboy bato. Execution for Jews is by throwing stones. That's even why, how did Stephen die? Remember how Stephen was martyred? How was Stephen martyred in Acts chapter 7? Haboy mga bato. That was the Jewish method of execution. That was what the law, the law of God commanded that. If someone was to die, they died by throwing stones at them. It was very personal because the people who were making the accusation had to do the actual execution. You threw the stones. Remember when Jesus was questioned in John chapter 8 regarding the woman caught in adultery? And his statement was, whoever has no sin, let him cast the first stone. There it is. That's the Jewish form of execution. You had to personally throw the stones at the person that you were accusing. Now, this says pierce your hands and feet. An obvious reference to crucifixion. But this was written a thousand years before the cross. 700 years before crucifixion was even invented. Crucifixion was invented by the Medo-Persians. It was invented about 300 AD. It was perfected by the Romans. They made it much more gruesome. But needless to say, it didn't even exist when David wrote this. Yet prophetically, he tells us exactly how the Messiah would be executed by the piercing of his hands and feet. Which, did you ever wonder, how does crucifixion kill you? I mean, if you put nails in my hands and you put nails in my feet, suck it, good, but I'm going to live. I mean, if you put a hole in my hand, that's not going to kill me. If you put a hole in my foot, that's not lethal. So how does crucifixion kill? Have you ever wondered? It is horrifying. The intent of crucifixion is you'll take a nail straight through, not your wrist. If you put a nail here, it would just rip out of your hand. Not pleasant, but it wouldn't hold. If you put a nail here, it won't go anywhere. It can hold the full weight of your body. So you drive a nail into your hand here, which, by the way, severs your major nerve into your hand. Have you ever heard of people who have carpal tunnel where they can't use their hands? That instantly severs that nerve. It would be incredibly painful just with the severing of that nerve, both sides. When they put a nail in your foot, don't think of someone standing vertical. They would bend their knees and nail them this way into the cross so that all of your weight is coming down upon your foot, not standing up, but like this. What this does is for about the first two or three minutes, you can hold your weight on your legs. Then your legs get very tired and they begin to collapse, meaning all of your weight falls upon your arms and the nails that are in them. Now, you try to pull up with your arms to give your legs some relief, but you go back and forth, eventually you become so exhausted, you no longer can hold yourself and your arm begins to pull out of its socket. Your elbows dislocate. You actually will gain about five or six inches in length as you dislocate both of those appendages and you no longer can push yourself up and you begin to suffocate. Because if you are like this, try breathing if you do like this. You can't get air in. You can exhale, but you cannot inhale. And your body begins to die from a lack of oxygen. But it takes hours, if not days, for you to die. It is slow, painful suffocation is what crucifixion does. This is the piercing of your hands and your feet. It has the effect because of a lack of oxygen of your heart beginning to beat very fast. And you go into what's called hypovolemic shock because of a lack of fluids in your body and because of a lack of oxygen, which is why when Jesus' heart was pierced by the spear, it had a water sack around it. Basically, it had a blister from beating so fast and water and blood poured out. So what did Jesus die from? Well, look at our text. It's all written right here for us. 
his heart melted like wax within him. He was dried up. Remember when he cried out on the cross, I thirst? He had no fluids left in his body. Literally, he was dehydrated. I thirst and my tongue clings to my jaws. I have been brought down to the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. Non-believers, those who do not have faith. The congregation of the wicked encloses me. The soldiers, the Jewish priests. They pierce my hands and my feet, although I do not have any broken bones. Interestingly, he said, I can count all my bones. Not one bone of his body was broken as he died. Well, that brings us to an interesting verse. In verse 18, which is the fact that they gambled over his clothing. Notice, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now stop right there for a moment. This verse... Psalm 22, 18 is the only one quoted in all four Gospels. It's quoted in Matthew 27, 35, Mark 15, 24, Luke 23, 34, and John chapter 19, verse 24. All four Gospels quote this verse, I think because of the incredible detail it gives us. It's not talking in generalities. It's saying, when I was crucified, pierced, nailed, They took my clothing and gambled for it. They took my garment, my coat, and gambled for it amongst them, which is exactly what we read they did. The problem was this for the Roman soldiers. If you crucified somebody, your bonus, part of your benefit was, whatever he owned, you got to keep. So when they crucified Jesus, they got to take his clothes which they just split that amongst them. I mean, one soldier got his shirt, another soldier got his pants, another one got his shoes. They just divided his clothing. But he had a very nice coat that had no seam in it. It was one piece of cloth, quite valuable, worth some money. And they didn't want to tear that up to divide it, so they said, well, how do we deal with this then? We'll gamble for it. We'll roll the dice, and whoever wins the roll gets to keep the cloak. Exactly as was predicted. They divided his clothes, but they gambled for his coat, showing us the detail to which God is in control of everything. If you ever wondered if the cro- cro- what happened on the cross, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, if it was something that just took place, if it was an accident, if God lost control, if it wasn't part of his plan, Oh no, it was very much every bit what he desired, every bit his plan, down to the minutest detail of how they parted his clothing and gambled for his coat. God was in absolute control of everything during the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. But that brings us to verses 19 through 21, which is the answer from the Lord. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog or the unbeliever. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of wild oxen. You have answered me. Now, this is interesting. The Lord is crying out, recognizing I need help. Jesus is saying, Lord, save me. Save me from the wild oxen. Save me from the wild dogs. Save me from the lion. Potentially, by the way, referring to three different groups of people. Who are the wild oxen? Well, the strength of Israel, the strong men of Judah. Who are the dogs? Well, dogs in the Bible are a picture of unbelievers. So that would be the Romans, the Roman army, the Gentiles. Who's the lion? Well, this one's not hard. Who's the lion in the Bible? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Satan is like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You have Jews, you have Gentiles, you have Satan, all desiring to destroy Jesus. And he's going, Lord, hear me. Lord, save me. Lord, help me. Notice there in verse 21. You have answered. Now, we're not told here what the answer was. 
Ano sa bakang ginoo sa iya? He said, Buling sa ako ang ginoo. Ano sa bakas ang ginoo sa iya? Luke chapter 22, verse 42. The answer is not in Psalm 22, but the answer is given to us in the Gospels. For what Jesus prayed, when Jesus prayed, He did so in the Garden of Gethsemane, which we mentioned earlier. Remember that he took Peter, James, and John away a little further into the garden and he knelt down and he prayed before the Lord, God, take this cup from me. God, save me. God, help me. God, don't make me go to the cross. Three times he prayed it. But what was the answer that was given? Not my will, but yours be done. God prayed, Jesus asked for redemption, and God ultimately said, no, this is the way it must be. And as I thought about that, that was powerful. I mean, you see this picture of the crucifixion, this picture of the suffering of Christ, the trouble that came out upon him, the trials he had to go through, the cross he had to endure. And he knew all of it was coming, and he didn't want to do any of it. Who would? But ultimately said, not my will, but yours be done. And and guys, it's not for us to dictate to the Lord how he wants to use us, what he wants to do with our lives. We come to God and say, God, I want to be used. He says, well, then do this. Uh, Lord, can I be used a different way? Lord, is there something else that I could be a part of because I really don't want to do that? The Lord might say, go out and be a witness in the plaza. Lord, I hear there's some really nice places over in SM. They need Jesus too in the mall. Not the plaza, please. Who are we to tell God how to use us? Not my will, but yours be done. Even if it means crucifixion, even if it means dying to myself, Lord, I am here to obey. This is what Jesus did. Lord, you have answered. And the answer is, I will do your will. Which brings us to the praise. As we've gone through the crucifixion, it ultimately brings us to salvation. Notice verses 22 and 23. For Jesus, as a result of the crucifixion, praised the Lord before four different groups of people. And notice verse 22. First and foremost, he said, I will declare your name to my brethren. So in light of the gospel, in light of the cross, in light of salvation, Jesus said, I'm going to tell everybody about you, particularly my family. Now, I got to be honest. If we talk about sharing the gospel, the hardest people to share the gospel with, parente, family. You might ask, why is that? I mean, I can go tell a stranger about Jesus, but my parents or, or my relatives, oh, family knows us. Family saw us grow up. Family knows all of our mistakes, all of our shortcomings, all of our failures, and they like to remind us about them. They think when we bring them a message, it's a message about us. We don't come to talk about us, we come to talk about Jesus. But even Jesus would say in Mark chapter 6, verse 4, a prophet is not without honor except in his own home. Jesus' his own family, his own brothers, his own sisters did not believe in him until after the cross, and then many of them ultimately did get saved. But for many years, they rejected him. And so don't be surprised when family is very hard to reach, but that doesn't mean you don't try. Just because it's difficult, just because they might be stubborn, just because they might make fun of us, they might attack us, we love them enough to continue trying to reach them. Jesus, first and foremost, said, I will declare your name. I will give the gospel to my brethren, to my family. But there's a second place. Notice verse 22 again. He said, I will also in the midst of the assembly praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. So the second group was the church. The assembly speaks of the gathering together of the believers. So, in light of the gospel, in light of the cross, in light of the crucifixion, we are to gather together as an assembly, and we are to intensely sing praises to boast concerning the Lord. Anyone who fears the Lord 
should proclaim the Lord among their church in the, in the family of God. Which, by the way, we have this verse actually quoted in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. Hebrews 2, 11, quoting from this psalm says, For which reason he is not ashamed to call them our brethren. So because we praise the Lord in the church, Jesus looks down and says, you are my family. You are my brother. He's not ashamed to call us brethren in light of our worship and praise to him because we've been redeemed, because he paid our debt that we might be saved. We praise him not just in family, we praise him in the congregation. But there's a third place we praise him. Notice verse 23. He said, all you descendants of Jacob glorify him. Now, I found this fun. There's two ways you can refer to Jacob. Unang analan para sa iya, Yaakov. Ang ikatuang analan para sa iya, Israel. And usually that's with purpose. When you hear Jacob referred to as Jacob, it refers to Jacob when he was not a good man. When he was doing things apart from the Lord. And so the idea is to those who do not yet know the Lord, those who are just around us who are not yet saved, glorify God in front of them. Tell them about Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 10 tells us, how can someone get saved if we don't tell them? How can someone get saved if we don't go and preach to them? Blessed are the feet of those who bring the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things, for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So, Go to those who are unbelievers and tell them about the good news that Jesus died. But not just the unbelievers. Notice verse 24. Fear him, all you offspring of Israel. So you give glory to those who do not know the Lord, talking about him. But you encourage fear amongst those who do believe in him. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so we preach to everyone. We give this message to all around us, to family, to the church, to unbelievers, to believers, encouraging them all with the message that Jesus was crucified for our salvation. Because notice fifth and finally, in verses 24 through 31, we have the reasons for our praise. And there are three of them. Three reasons why we should be praising the Lord amongst the brethren, amongst the family, amongst the nations. Number one, because he is not hidden. Notice verse 24. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from them, but when they cried to him, he heard. So literally, God did not despise the humble. This is the first reason why we praise him, because God, among all the ubos, those who see their need for salvation, those who see their need for the Lord, God hears them. James chapter 4, verse 6, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, tells us that God resists the proud, but he pours out his grace upon the humble. God hears those who recognize they need him. For that reason, we declare him everywhere to everybody, tell everybody the good news about the cross. The problem is, a lot of people don't think they need the cross. Do you remember the church of Laodicea? Revelation chapter 3. The church of Laodicea who said, we think we are rich and we are wealthy. And we have need of nothing. We're fine. We're doing good. We have no need of anything. But Jesus looked at them and said, You are poor, wretched, blind, naked, and miserable. We think we don't need. We don't think we have any desperate need for Jesus Christ. But the truth is, we need the Lord. And therefore, If we humble ourselves, if we're willing to recognize our need, God will hear us. He does not hide his face to those who are humble. Number two. The second reason why we praise him is according to verses 25 through 26. Because of the vow. My praise shall be before you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. 
So we are to pay our vow to the Lord. What vow do we pay to the Lord? To tell others about the good news. The vow we give is to make sure that people who are humble can be satisfied spiritually. The poor can be satisfied by hearing the message that God will respond to all those who seek him and give him a heart to live forever. So the vow we have, the command we're given, is to go out and tell everybody. Why do we praise him? Because of what he's done. How do we fulfill the vow we've given to him? To tell everybody around us about the gospel of Jesus given to us a thousand years before he actually was crucified on the cross. But there's a third and final reason why we praise him. Notice verses 27 through 31. And that's the bow. For we will all one day bow. At the ends of the world, all the ends of the world, remember and turn to the Lord. All of the families and the nations shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall lead in worship. All those who go down to the dust will bow before him. Even he cannot keep himself alive. A posterity shall serve him. It shall be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born. He has done this. So remember and turn to the Lord. All the ends of the earth. Literally everybody should be turning, cause to turn and worship the Lord. Because the kingdom belongs to him. All of the nations belong to him. All of the riches belong to him. And everyone will one day have to answer and bow before him. Therefore, we should proclaim and worship him. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us that Jesus will reign until one day all enemies are brought under his feet. He will rule over everyone and everything because he went to the cross. Because of the victory that he had over sin through the crucifixion. And therefore, we want to be on his side. We want to be those who have faith in him. Those who humbly bow down to him and tell others about him. Because his plan, his redemption written a thousand years beforehand, in detail, is one, it is the only one, way in which we can come and be saved. The only way to have the guarantee of heaven. That's Psalm chapter 22. It's the psalm, the prophecy of the cross of Jesus Christ. The hope, the plan of God for salvation. Questions? Questions?